Hello, everyone. My name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. And as you can see, I've got a very special episode today where we're doing another interview with Dolly Safran, the subject of my book, Symmetry, A True UFO Adventure. We've already done a number of really interesting interviews, five in fact, where we've talked about how her experiences began as a little girl in Florida in the Everglades, uh, where she had a lot of contact moving all the way up to age 14, where she had her first fully conscious onboard experience. And we've talked about the different types of ETs she's seen, the photographic evidence she's gotten, some of the places, the worlds that she's visited. We've covered quite a bit in these previous five interviews, but this is number six, and I call this one Interview with a Fully Conscious UFO Contactee, Part 6, Flight School. That's right, we're going to be talking about how Dolly was given the opportunity to learn how to fly these craft and her experiences with being tested with that, trained with that, learning how to do it the first time, some of the many adventures she's had with this. As you may know, if you've looked into some of my other YouTube episodes or read some of my books, this is not unique. People are taught how to fly these craft, but Dolly's experiences with this are really extensive, certainly the most extensive and detailed that I've ever had the opportunity to hear about. So we're just going to do a deep dive into that. And we're going to learn some new stuff that's not in the book, because that always happens every time I talk to you, Dolly. So first of all, let me just uh, introduce you. This is Dolly Safran. Thanks so much for coming on to the show again. You're welcome. I'm <laughs> glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Hey, the uh, honor is mine. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited, Dolly, because, yeah, your experiences with all of this are so amazing. And uh, I have heard it before, but not to the detail that you've provided. So I thought we would just start with, you know, your experience at age 14, 1973, I think it was. Yes. And uh, they asked you, you know, how do you want to work with us? Is there anything you're particularly interested in? And you said, yes, <laughs> I would love to learn how to fly these craft. Not really even expecting <laughs> that they would say yes. Uh, so, uh, I thought we'd just start there and you know, have you describe, you know, what that was like when they said yes and how they tested you, because we did go into a little bit in the book. It wasn't just, yes, you know, sit in the seat and let's do it. Uh, it was a whole involved process of learning, you know, first of all, seeing if you were even qualified, I guess, or um, had the, um, what is the, yeah, the capability to do it. So, yeah, how did that unfold when you they said? You know, you um, might, uh, might. After that, in, yeah, after that initial session with them, they gave me about two weeks uh, to prepare myself because it wasn't going to be an ordinary contact. I was going to be physically checked out, physically and mentally. And uh, so the next time I was on board, I was uh, given um, several physicals and mental checkups. And uh, they were looking basically at my uh, the neurology of my brain, uh, whether my synapse were in good condition. And if I was wired well to my own body, uh, my own body plays a significant role in this, how I react to things what my reflexes are capable of doing and how much I'm capable of uh, handling in an experience that could potentially be critical and how I would react to that. Uh, my body, they wanted to know that I was physically fit enough to endure what I was about to learn. And uh, they checked everything on my heart, my lungs, my muscles, my everything, all of it. Uh, this took them about two, three weeks. Oh, wow. wow. And, at the end of that, um, I was brought back up and sat down and it, it was explained to me that I did uh, meet the, their standards. And then the next set of tests were basically psychic. After that, they needed to know how well developed I was, how much they were going to be investing in uh, teaching me to employ, fully employ my abilities and uh, work with another psychically 
to link up with and whether I was compatible with this entity or not. And that would have been Talara. Um, Talara being the ship. The yes. entity yes. actually who embodies. It's an actual entity, yes. And um, so that took about a month. And uh, that was very extensive work that they did with me. And well, well, I before had. Before we get, uh, before we move beyond that, um, can we dive a little deeper into that? Because here's a question I have. You know, yeah. they're talking to you psychically, telepathically the whole time. Right. There's a lot of that sort of stuff going on when you're on board. Is, would you say your abilities are more in tune or more, how would I put it, enhanced when you're on craft as opposed to being here on Earth? You're, are you activating it more? Are you using it more? You know what Not I mean? an enhancement as much it is, as it is that I am psychic, I can hear them, and they pretty much uh, take over the conversation. They, they're they they're psychically coming on to me and hearing what I have to say. I'm not summarily broadcasting fully to them yet. And they wanted to see how well I was able to employ myself, my own abilities, so that they heard me on my own. And uh, there was a little bit of work that I had to do with that. I was already broadcasting so that they could hear me, but it wasn't as quick or, um, the communication level has to be even. In other words, I had to learn language. I had to learn uh, custom. I had to learn uh, how they react to things. It's a mutual two-way street and that I had to become one in communion with them. And that took a little bit of work. That was one of the first things that they taught me in my training was to bring that level of my understanding them up. And once I reached that and I was comfortable with them, then the, then the next phase of training began. And that would be linking with Talata. When I, okay. Linking with Talata uh, required my ability to remote view. Uh, there's a second level of remote viewing that most people don't realize that they're capable of doing. And that is, I'm able to remote view to a source, a space, and then join with Talata in that space. It's an electromagnetic field. And we literally allow ourselves to enjoin mentally. And I become him and he becomes me. And um, even though my body is autonomously still operating on its own, me, I'm enjoined with him. And what happens to me when that happens is I feel what he feels. I see what he sees. And when he's in craft and dwelling in craft with me that way, I become the craft with him. I can feel it breathe. I can feel it move. I can feel what's outside of it. My eyesight no longer operates independently through my own eyes. I see through his eyes and the craft system's eyes. I feel with the system, all of it. Um, that's why the craft is basically an, uh, an organic entity itself, because it has to neurologically join up with the entity operated just like I'm indwelling my body and my brain to in operate this entity here, my physical being, I become that with him on craft. All right. Uh, this makes sense to me because this is exactly what Julia, that's a pseudonym, told me. And uh, gosh, I think I wrote about her book and or her story in my book, Wondrous. Uh, there was a chapter in there about her, which was called a gray alien named Sen. And she said when she hooked up telepathically with him, he was in his ship and she could see through his eyes everything he experienced, she experienced, and vice versa. And that's exactly. when he started doing all these maneuvers. <laughs> and right. she said she exactly. could, feel it, she could yeah. see it. And she, it was like she was actually there right. was through his eyes. So that would be an advanced form of remote viewing, I guess, or linking up. Linking, yes. Remote to link, yes. And right. uh, once I achieved that, the next phase of my training was understanding how the craft itself is built and works and operates what's going on on that craft physically as well as mentally and how it operates and i had to learn a lot of math i had to learn a lot of physics i had to learn what uh the type of fusion that they were using to um use this element that they burned to create a graviton wave and once i understood that that's part of what's happening to me while i'm in with Talata is I can feel that all working. Uh, Talata has total control over the energy of the craft. Uh, I have control over where we're going and directional, and I help open light gates. It takes the two of us together to open a, a light gate. 
Um, so the next thing I learned after that was the craft itself and how it operates. And then once we got that, I was on board with him and I learned the basics of movement in the craft. I had to learn direction. I had to learn speeds, uh, how to maneuver, how I physically was enjoined in this craft. And it became an extension of my mental body. And I was helping to steer it with my own mind. I was helping to slow it down or lower it or raise it or go skiff. I was learning what it felt like to have electromagnetic fields around me and the fields that were, you know, that were surrounding me in, in union with the fields that we were encountering. When we're in, inside in a magnetosphere on a planet, the electromagnetic guidelines or field lines of that planet, how they are, and they're all a little bit different. Um, I was ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not all exactly the same. Uh, but you feel them, you see them. And I learned to see, um, a, a, it's almost like a heads up display, but it's Talata showing me in real time, the lines themselves. I can see the energy of them through his eyes he, because he's more advanced than I am. He absolutely sees them and uh, reacting to them. Uh, they move suddenly, they shift suddenly, they rise or lower suddenly. This is not a fixed system inside this magnetosphere with these guidelines there it's like being on the ocean in a boat and you have to learn to pilot with the movement of these lines and negative or positive um, storms can change it uh, the sun itself can cause problems the sun can shoot off a flare or incoming uh, coronal you know winds can shift them it's like being an entire environment that you here don't see here or smell, but we do on craft this way because they're that advanced and I'm Yeah, we talked a little that. bit about this in the book where you actually went to their planet and learned with some other pilots as well. Yes. In a classroom environment where they went over and over and over. Yes. Different scenarios and yes. different ways, yes. magnetic fields and gravitational lines right. and all this stuff works. And right. There's a corollary to this. Pilots here who are surfing the air, you know, they're flying on on top of the air in a fixed wing vehicle. Um, it's not the same as an electromagnetic environment that I'm in, but there is an electromagnetic component to a pilot's life in the seat while they're flying this planet. They, they also have pockets of uh, dead air. They have turbulence, everything, and they have to join up with that and they're their reflexes play 100% into that. They learn to feel things and see them and know when things are coming in and encompassing them. And so there are there are tactics, flight tactics. So I learned to, with these students, uh, when this is happening, you do this. So when this is happening, you drop. Or when you're losing a guideline, you go straight up, you get out of there, okay? You have to have the reflexes to do that. Uh, sometimes people see UFOs dancing around in the sky and they're like, what the hell is going on? That's what's going on. They've got uh, a lot happening to them while they're up there. And if you see them dancing or doing weird things, they're not as much putting on a show to you as that they're surfing this and they're having to stay, you know. Uh, so this explains this motion that we see, like yes. people, riding it's on a wave. all around us, yes. Or the pendulum movement as well or falling. Exactly. We feel, yeah, there's some... Uh, to that there is a um the earth itself heaves and breathes itself and it it can shoot up electromagnetic energy from its core and it'll heave out and you can feel it or it'll drop you can feel that as well it's amazing it's very much like being on the ocean very much or in the air flying a regular airplane yeah well you made an interesting uh point to me once that said we're not actually flying in the in the traditional sense uh, they don't call it flying, is that right? Yeah, it's skiffing. Skiff. <laughs> <laughs> it's not right. skimming the ocean. We skiff mag magnetic energy. Okay, before That's we move on uh, anymore, I wanted to, wondered if you could describe a little bit about the seat you sit in, because is that seat normally designed for grays, and how does it fit you? And I mean, you drew it. I'll, I'll picture it, it here. alters it. it uh, Talata can alter the seat to fit anybody who sits in it tall, short, heavy, whatever. And uh, it's so what I drew is how I fit the seat, what it looks like for me. Um, the first time I ever sat down when it was still for a gray and he hadn't changed it yet, and they realized, oh, 
go get it fixed the chair for her. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of funny. And I was like, mm, I don't think this is going to work. Um, I have two pads under my feet, and they are to stop me from electromagnetically charging. Uh, it's like a Faraday cage under my feet. I have a field around me, and this is a very big craft. And uh, the smaller craft, we almost have a real Faraday cage about us. Um, it's a field, and it protects us from being electrocuted. That means death. If you're electrocuted, you would die. And so it stops me from doing that. I also wear nothing that will charge. Nothing. The suit that I wear is protects me from that. And my hair is not down like this. I'm. It's pulled back very tightly. Um, there's a gel that I put in it that helps not conduct electricity or static over me, oh, and it's they, either braided or ponytail. Did they yeah. give you a gel kind of thing, or is that That's something? a gel. It's a type of gel. Yeah, it washes out easy, but it protects me from charging. They and, give it uh, to you, is my question. They give you an actual gel to put in, or is that some? Oh, oh wow. So you, they give you an actual flight suit uh, and a gel? That's very interesting. All right. So, uh, is the seat comfortable? <laughs> Very. It's um, it's. Uh, I mold into it, and it uh, will adjust to me as I'm flying. Like if I was to drop suddenly, and I, pop, you know, we come back down, I'm held in it somehow. You know, it keeps me connected to it, so I don't break contact with it because to do that would shoot me with electricity. You would bleed. So the seat holds on to me. Uh, it doesn't let me go. Um, it's so of, comfortable that if I have a backache one day, it'll puff up my, uh, it'll puff up behind my lumbar spine and give me a little lumbar support. It knows the, the craft knows. I mean, once you're connecting mentally up with it, it feels what I feel anyway. So it's correcting for me all the time. And the, it's a very good ride. It also helps my circulation. I don't get, um, you know, I, if you sit that hard and flat on something for a long time, you can develop problems in your circulation to your legs. And it's, Gauge to help keep me, my blood flow to my legs uh, going. You know, I have good circulation in the chair. Uh, you know, this cool. reminds me of, you know, a, a portion of Travis, Travis Walton's Walton. experience where he actually, you know, left the, I guess you would call it the exam room, went down the corridor, turned one direction or another, I think it was right, in, into this other little room, which as he got to the center became transparent all around. He saw these st stars and there was a chair. And he sat down in it, and there were these little knobs and buttons, and he started pressing them, and the stars were moving around. And um, I'm wondering, are there any buttons or knobs on the seat that you were in? Because would have presented itself to him by the pilot as something that he was familiar with that would help him understand to try it. In other words, he wasn't mentally connecting with the craft per se, but the craft gave him the opportunity to do something that felt familiar to him, to teach him that he could do these things, look out, la la, that kind of thing. When human beings go on board and they see things like that, it's basically the craft accommodating them. It's not necessary for the craft to operate that way. It doesn't really use them. But for humans, or, yeah, no I wonder about that because I mean, variation there. Because when you went on at age 14 and you actually got to fly that first time, they gave you a little sort of joystick device or a little it's wand. It's a wand. It's a wand. It's about that long. And it's about that wide and it tapers down. And when you touch it, you can feel it. It kind of vibrates in your hand a little bit. And uh, it connected my consciousness with Talata so that I could join with him without knowing how. And it was really cool. All right. So after going through all this, you know, learning and then sort of testing, uh, you actually got to sit down next to, was it the AI Greys or? Yes, was I had an AI Grey and I had a tall Grey with me who was a pilot also. And I began the process of actually learning how to employ what I had learned. Uh, it's like becoming a, um, you know, if you're going to become a surgeon, you have to get in there, you know. It's all hand-eye motor coordination, linking up mentally to put physical use, mental use to what you've just learned and to employ it often over and over and over until it becomes a, a, a habit, you know, uh, not even thinking about it. You can just do it without even thinking now. And it took a while to do that. Um, 
you know, so th there's two years of that type of training. There, there's kind of two different things going on here when you fly a craft, right? There's what I guess you would call interplanetary travel. And in then stellar, inter outside, outside the magnetosphere of a planet. All right. It's, yeah. So is that differentiated from the beginning? Were you learning both? I had to learn both to operate because we mostly try when we travel, we light gate between that we're going and we come in, we're stellar, interstellar. And we either come in very close to a planet or we're way back out and then we fly in and then you have to transition into their magnetosphere and go into their atmosphere. And, uh, it takes a little bit of doing how to do that because we're changing the way the ship is operating. We're going from a nuclear uh, needed energy source to a battery after that. Once we come in a magnetosphere, we change over to batteries because it's too hot. Uh, you can take what we are driving with in, in on you, it's too hot. Uh, we're talking over 7,000 degrees outside the craft alone, or even. And it's so bright, you couldn't look at it, it burn your crop here. All right, so are you hearing any noise when this is all going on? Here outside the ship with Colada, so yes, I can hear um, density. In other words, um, we don't really fly, we don't have a, we don't react to the air mass that we're in. We, it's like we do nothing to us, but I can hear things operating around me that are coming in at us on a frequency level that are electronic from this planet. It's incredible. This is a very chatty place. There's a lot going on here, and we can actually hear it. This is coming off this planet, clicking, chirping, uh, that kind of thing. We hear TV sometimes. We hear all kinds of things, music. It just depends on where we're at and what we're doing, and a lot is going to allow uh, to come in wise into the signals that I'm hearing. Um, okay, so when you're flying so over a planet, do, do you have like displays that show like the magnetic fields or you know what I mean? Little temperatures or whatever. I have a mental heads up display <laughs> that comes down before me mentally that a lot is projecting to me and I can see every satellite in the sky coming down here. I can see debris. Oh. I can see birds flying in your atmosphere. I can see whales swimming in the sea. There are different levels of density that I'm looking at, and we avoid coming in contact with those as we fly. It's a very, very populated place here, and we have to be careful how we come through. Uh, we, we're not in the business of destroying technology that belongs to somebody else. So it's a, it's a concentrated effort to come down safely. That's another reason you see them zigzagging. There are many reasons why they do it, because they're avoiding objects as they come in. Oh, wow. So did a lot of your training take place here in Earth's atmosphere or other places as well? Yes, once I got good at it, I was definitely being trained here as well, yes. Okay, so you're sitting next to these... This gray, these grays, I guess, a tall, what did you say, medium gray and an AI gray? AI grays and a tall gray, right. All right, and, but they're the ones who are actually in the pilot seat at this point, and, and you're just linking up with them? Uh, at the beginning, once I became proficient at flying, uh, I had, uh, Talada had the ability to stop me from doing something stupid. He can control the craft at will, and so they allowed me uh, the seat and uh, just watched me, watch dark me through the whole thing. Um, I have made mistakes during my training. I have learned the hard way a few times, uh, not to the point that I crashed or caused anybody any problems, but yeah, I've had a few close calls. Um, they taught me a great deal. Don't do that again. You learn, you know, pay attention. Um, don't lose, con you know, don't lose uh, focus. Um, I've been accused of being a very serious person all the time, and it's the training that I've, had I can be very, very single mindedly point, <laughs> I won't let you along with it, and that's my training at work. I can't help myself, that's the way I am. It was taught to me. So, you know, this went on from age 14 up to age 19 before you actually got to sit down and do it yourself. I own that's correct, yes. And can you describe that first time and what it was like? Because you said there's an energy ball. People talk about the little purse that you see in the Anunnaki carrying. And it was part of my training. Pine cone and all that, so it's, this is all connected to that. It's the source where I connect with Talata. It's an electromagnetic uh, 
<laughs> you know, decahedron, and um, it expands. It's it's about this big, smaller than a baseball, and it looks metal. Although I'm not positive 100% what kind of metals are employed in it, but it's electromagnetic. It has a power source in it, a seed. And when I initialize it, I have a implant in my hand that um, I can turn on and it brings it to life. When you see those hair glyphs and you see the watch with the daisy in it, you know, or whatever it is they've got, that's their key. Oh. Mine was implanted. And, uh, Looks stupid walking around with a watch like that all the time. So mine was implanted in my hand. They decided it was better off in my hand. And um, do is I have a purse, just like the ones that you see. I'm the pilot. And then I open my purse. It doesn't exactly look like that. That's a beautiful representation of it. Mine's a little bit more sick than that. And I open it up and I take the ball out with my hand, this hand. While it's in my hand, I make the connection to it. And I hold it across my chest, chin low, and there's a arm that comes up on the other side with an electromagnetic hook. And once I initialize the ball, it leaves my hand on its own, it magnetically jumps up, and then it expands and expands, and then it'll guide up to that hook to hold it. It's about this far from the hook at all times, but it's there. And it's a it's a space, an electromagnetic field space where I now remote view to it. I go into it. I put my consciousness into that ball. It's a lot is already there waiting for me. And that's how we fly outside the magnetosphere. I don't need it in in here, in our space here, but I need it outside, especially to light gate. That is a magnifier of energy in to learn and I both use it together to light gate to go to different places. All right, so can you describe more about what a light gate is? Because, you know, people use terms like wormholes and portals. And uh, that's, I think, in essence, what they're trying to describe is more what you're talking about, a light gate. But, but, uh, you know, wormholes. The frequencies that are not within humans sound sight. You can't perceive of them. They're so high up in the frequency down or so low that uh, you couldn't even know how to use them. They're unknown to humanity because A, you're not using your abilities. You can't see or hear them. That's the rule number one. And then the second one is you have to be very, very advanced to know what it sounds like and to generate it in your own brain. Uh, it took me a long time to learn how to do that. Uh, Talada brought me through it first. It is a sound that I couldn't even describe to you. It is a frequency that is unbelievable. And it took me about probably a year or more to get that correct, exactly correct, because it's a very specific frequency that we generate together. And it literally opens a dimensional rift or opening between dimensions. And then we gauge, I know the coordinates. I'm going to go through this with us to wherever it is we're going and I employ that ability as well. I am the gatekeeper and the gate shutter. I can open the gate with Tolada and then once we're on the other side of it I let go and it shuts. If I'm in a long line of other craft and we're all going through one together we all employ our abilities together because the gate has to be much bigger and the last person through shuts the gate. We're trained to do that as well. Um, it is very fast. It's milliseconds through we hold our breath when we go through it because there is no air. We're, we become interdimensional once we employ it. We are already out of this dimension as we create this thing. And we're interdimensional as well. We're non-dimensional. We're outside of everything once we get through. And then wherever we end up, we bring ourselves back because we're always in the third dimension when we travel. When we get to where we're going. Everything I, everywhere I go in this universe is in the third dimension. All right, so here, let me just see if I have this correct. So what basically the light gate is a process of generating huge amounts of electricity to a point that it, it um, opens up it into out of third dimension. Okay, so is this going into like the fourth or fifth or sixth, or is this beyond that? Go through the fifth dimension. That's why Talat is so uh, substantially aware of us and why they help us 
Um, and it's their technology that that I learned in this dimension who is able to learn it. It's the fifth dimensional frequency that we use and we go right through to it. And, uh, it's very fast and it's very been taken to the fifth dimension like uh, a handful of times in my life. And uh, the first time I went to I had to hold me up <laughs> because I see everything in that dimension. You, you see everything in that dimension. I can see through to the third dimension from the fifth dimension in ways you can't even explain. Uh, it made me, it's like the first experience on craft. I, I wanted to puke. He was stopping me. Um, and I only stayed there for about three minutes. That's all I could take. And they brought me back out. He um, gave me an opportunity a few times after that to train to go into it because they felt like if I did that, I would take the jump through the light gate much better than I did because I had first started experiencing really, really weird symptoms of going through that light gate. I would puke. I'd get dizzy. I almost want to pass out. And they had to get me past it. So they were bringing me into fifth dimension to get me used to what it's like. Well, that's what I was going to say. So what, what exactly does it feel like when you... You know, because you're there in the craft and it's all third dimensional, but then the gate opens up and you go through it and you come back out. What does that feel like? Does it feel like you lose all cohesion with your physical form? It, it lights up. It my molecules like um, you know, it, you know, you know, you look at your hand, you know it's there, you see it, but it's longer physical. You become light. And, oh, wow. Um, it's, so you can travel any distance through a light gate? Yes, we can go any distance. Um, it, one of the things I had to learn was coordinates and where I am. I have an eidetic memory, and one of my talents in life is that I remember everywhere I've ever gone. I never get lost. And I employ that in learning where I'm going. To go somewhere, I have to have already been there to know where it is. So part of the training is another driver or pilot takes you there, teaches you where that is, and then you jump with them a couple times, and then you got it, and it's in your mind, and you know. Um, this is critical, because without the ability to do that, you can't pilot a craft. So they, they made me learn everywhere I go, and I have this that I'm absolutely top where they are. I can go at any time. So this just They're underlines movement. how truly integrated you know, travel and these craft themselves, technologically speaking, are with psychic abilities and other dimensions, I guess, is a way of putting it. So the craft themselves are partly, I think you mentioned this once, if I remember correctly, partly built in other dimensional ways. Especially the element comes from the fifth dimension, it's created there. It's very specific and it can't be created in our dimension. It wouldn't exist here. And they're trying to make it now and they're never going to make it. It's too hard. It has to be in that dimension and then they ship it in with the craft at that time. Okay, so another um, point I kind of wanted to go over was you know, in science fiction, it's all about faster than light travel. And if you know your science and you know your physics, it's absolutely really impossible to go the speed of light because the faster you go the more your mass increases so and these guys are not traveling apart at the seams yes so you're not traveling at the speed of light by any means right yeah. i'm going through a light gate that takes a millisecond to get me from one space to another uh, it's described here einstein wanted to represent it as folding space okay we're going away from here to here it's folding space, and you can get the gate really close this way. And you go through, so you've gone this many miles in a millisecond, and you generate the light. The light already knows it's there. It's all part of everything, and you land there. Okay, you know That's what I, I can describe that. What I'd really like to do is read a short quote to you from uh, this gentleman I interviewed. I'm using a pseudonym. His name is Carter. I have not publicly revealed his story yet. It's coming in a forthcoming book. But he started talking about this experience he had. Uh, it actually was on Hawaii where he was with his wife off-grid in a cabin and the whole cabin filled with white light. 
twice actually. They woke up sometime later, I think having had missing time. He had a mark on his left arm. She had one on her right, both in the same spot. And she, he's like, did you have any memories of what happened? She's like, well, yeah, I remember being in this weird craft and I think I saw a gray and so forth. And he remembered something really interesting as well. And this is what I'd like to quote. It's just about a minute long, but it reminds me, Dolly, so much of how you described becoming one with a craft and how they're flown psychically. Because that's what it sounds like happened to him. And I'll just quote him here as he says, this whole thing just unfolded in my head. I'm hoping you can quote on this or, you know, comment on this. This whole thing just unfolded in my head. I was like almost a specialist kind of pilot. And I, my consciousness had been put into this UFO type of machine. My consciousness. This machine was so sophisticated. It was like a living nervous system that needs a living consciousness to operate it just like our physical body. I was test piloting some kind of new system. It was like I was immersed in it. I was inside. I was the consciousness inside the living wiring of this thing. It was very complex, as complex as the body. Just look at all the systems in the body and the layers of complexity for digestion, circulation, and so forth. It was like that, but when I think of it, it was like it was all golden. It was like everything was made of gold filaments. Everything was golden and clean and super su precise and yet living. It had a living dynamic to it. It was super responsive to your consciousness, whatever I was thinking. So yeah, he had the feeling like he was learning how to pilot these craft. And how he described it reminded me so much of what you're saying. That it's not only a, like a living system, but you're psychically joined to it to a degree where you you almost lose your own well not lose but join with the awareness of the craft so does that sound familiar to you what he's saying absolutely yes he, uh, dead on yes so what do you think about his description of it being like all gold filaments and super clean just, and precise and, he's precise that's right everything lights up and uh the golden color is um much the perception you get of it, it's golden. Right. Wow, that's very cool. So you did this the first time. How how did you feel afterwards? I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> it took it out of me. I was tired. Oh my god, I was tired. Um, realized that the the um, gravity in what I was doing in that moment was not something I was going to play was reality to me and like I said the gravity of it was uh, all encompassing and it sat me down emotionally and down for a few days so I was immensely uh, I don't know how to describe it it's uh, it's not, it just sort of it hits you right through your own chest you know right where you live and um, I had to think carefully that moment on when I was doing it compelled me to not screw up after that that's how serious it was that's how emotional it was that's how unbelievably cool it was and um, it made me realize that I'm this teeny mini girl <laughs> and then, woo, you know and I was like namaste okay <laughs> you know we're good and it's amazing you're a teenager learning all this stuff. Well, you're 19, pretty much an adult, but still a teenager. And there were other people you had learned with as well. You made an interesting comment that most of them were women. Is that right? The women, women brains, women's brains, female brain, let's put it correctly. The female physiological mind is um, more uh, flexibly she's feeling and doing in her body it's the hormone axis the chemicals that we produce that sort of thing makes us physically uh, quicker than men are that, that's only one aspect of it though because we are all consciousness and outside of our bodies our consciousness is capable of anything you are tuning specifically tuned but your brain how you are in this iteration in this life that you're living now is tuned to that and so when you're indwelling in the craft, you're thinking with a female mindset. 
and the males are thinking with male mindsets. And uh, it doesn't matter what I'm doing in this lifetime, I'm still going to be a female. If I was to be born again and I went to pilot again and I was a male, I would be less likely to get the seat because of that. Um, but there are male not, pilots. It's right? Absolutely, because you can learn anything. If you have a mind to do it, you can learn anything. And that's a fact. So, All right. So after you learn how to do this and you're comfortable to do it, you started doing more complex things like flying with other people. Is that right? I mean, in terms of other people, yes. you first a couple and then you know, yeah. being part of a fleet. Right. Yeah, getting on board. We're, we're um, there's uh, many aspects of this. I mean, we're we're not just flying outside of a craft in our own craft. We have to board other craft to travel great distances sometimes, or just need a break, and we'll go onto a large craft to take a break. So you have to learn how to get on the ship with them. And if there's a lot of us doing it, there's a real learning curve there. Um, you know, knock somebody down. You don't want your field to bother their field. You want to do everything precisely in a certain way. Um, when we're coming down in on this planet, we're dealing with what's in the air here, and it's not just airplanes and jets. It's it's animals that are in the skies. Did, we, did, you, ever, did you ever take any like just fun joy rides? Like I just want to do something for fun. <laughs> yes. Um, you get permission. You give them an idea of what you're doing, like a flight plan. Um, they give you a time, that you schedule it, and then you go. And there are definite set rules I can't display to anybody. I have to be uh, stealthy. Um, if it's this planet, I have to be really stealthy. If it's another planet and another system, uh, there are planets that are wide open, and you can just go joyriding anywhere you want to go, sort of like a place. You know, to go have fun. Or any, even within the systems, but you're time limited to that because when you're outside a magnetosphere, getting radiation is not your friend. It's not a friend to the craft or to Lada and either. And uh, so be careful. Yeah. Well, well, one guy interviewed Tim from Louisiana uh, described how they took him on board and up to the control room, as they call it, the place of movement. And they were describing how they do it. And he, and he had the impression that these were young, kind of teenage grays, if you will, that they were mm -hmm. still learning and they were like, let's try this, let's try that maneuver. And they were having a good time with it. Absolutely. <laughs> I had days like that, yes. You know, I wanted to flex my mind out. I wanted to flex my abilities. And you can only do that by pushing yourself. And okay. you know, those are the days when it gets a little fun. Yes. I want to re read another really short quote because there was a guy that I interviewed in – in this book, Onboard UFO Experiences, Jay Gardner, who had an experience very much like yours, I think he was 14 or 12, actually 12, uh, when he was taken to the planet Saturn, like you described, and, and at one point they sat him down in the seat, and he had, they gave him what he just perceived as a sort of a joystick, but here's what he says happened. I took the controls and accidentally drove the craft right into the ground. I could see the rocks. We were passing through the rocks and there were all these sparks flying, dirt and everything. And at that point, the actual pilot took back control of the craft. Uh, so is that something that can happen? Can you actually go physically into the ground? We're in different phases of, of power around us. And we're employing different uh, modalities of flight. And uh, that's an interesting word. And uh, we can be ethereal, in other words, non-dimensional. We go outside this dimension, we're here and we're there at the same time. And uh, we can go through things. I can go through any building, go through the planet itself, although we don't go deep, but we can. Uh, we can go into the water. Um, sometimes you can go sit in the trees if you want to. Um, Have you done all these things then? Yeah. <laughs> Have you... Um ever like gone like so power to the ground okay I, I managed to not do that one thank you but, uh <laughs> yeah i've done some really i'm uh it's like cutting through butter <laughs> you know you just go whoop and you're there and it's uh, mind-blowing because you're seeing it when you're doing it and you're thinking that's gonna hurt go right through it yeah I, I think you described one incident i don't know if this was in the book but i heard another guy online talking about how he was taken on board a craft, but this craft actually came right into the house. Yes. And physics, so next thing he knows, he's on board, even though 
uh, they didn't pull him up. And it came into through the house. Is, is yeah, when I was when I was <laughs> older, I was in the house one night. It's after my father passed away. And I'm laying there and I'm thinking, you know, I've never actually got to see y'all come through the wall. And uh, Todd was laughing at me. And uh, I said, no, seriously, I want to see you come through the wall. And I begged for days. And then one night I got the answer. Uh, Todd said, you have an incoming prepare. I was like, okay, cool. And it's not a white light that lights you up. It's a red light. And you see them, I see them anyway, coming in as a red glow. And it literally came right through my bedroom about a foot down, not the whole crowd shown in the room, but the bottom half of it did. And they came right through the house real slow, laughing the whole way through. And I was just like, oh my God, is that what people see? And sometimes people do get to see that happen because they're picking them up that way. They'll pull you in. And they'll go right through your house to get you. And I've never done that. I've never done that. Oh, that's that's not how I do uh, pickups. <laughs> and uh, it was cool as hell. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they can go through anything. Yep. So when you go like into the water, what's that like? Does it? Do you feel it, or is there any? No. Sense? Well, you know, you're in water. In other words, you know when I'm in the sky. I know when I'm in the air, and I know when I'm close to the ground, and I know if I can, you know, going through the treetops or whatever. I perceive it. Water is different because you go, you almost want to hold your breath when you're going in because you think, <gasps> my breath, because you can see the water, you're going into the water. I don't feel a splash. I don't feel the, the barrier of the water. It's just air to me. I'm going through it. And um, we go down to a depth and uh, we will uh, sometimes cool off that way so that we can make a physical pickup of somebody. You got to cool the craft down. And it's too dangerous for them to come at us when we're that hot. And, uh, it's kind of cool. But we also open blankets underwater. Most people don't understand that. A lot of people report, I saw a light under my boat, everything lit up. That's a light gating operation. Uh, oh, wow. Very, um, very cool. Have you ever chased we a transition to some worlds where they're water worlds? And we do transition from water to water. We'll open the light gate in water and go through that way. And uh, it happens a lot. I mean, I. So, area that I'm flying is near the lakes, and I've gone into the Great Lakes quite a few times to light gate. Yeah. So when you're flying, like, there's, you know, interstellar travel, which is opening a light gate and boom, you're there. But then there's interplanetary. You're over a planet and you're surfing the gravitational field lines. Um. So when you're doing that, there's no buttons or knobs. You're just doom, connecting mentally, psychically. <laughs> All right, so that's including when you no transistors. Up. There's no, uh, there's no. What's the word I want to use? No computers. There are no uh, digital anything on board a craft. The craft, every system is separate because Talat is running them psychically. He's part of the craft, and he doesn't need connections between things. He's the whole craft at one time. Uh, so no, I don't need any of that. It's all mental. All right. Have you ever chased a car down the road while you're like? Doo -doo -doo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, okay. You're picking someone up. <laughs> I saw. Because uh, they do that. There's so many... a third kind. Okay, when I was young, young. Okay, this was in what 76, 77. It came out. I was still very young then, and uh, I got the idea. Ooh, that was like fun. And this is one of those things that I pushed the gate with. And uh, we were out west, not Midwest, okay, Indiana. It was one of those long Bodunk roads, you know, hardly anybody out there. And uh, we saw a car. And I thought, hmm. And I came down and I just sort of followed him for a while until he realized. And I put lights patterns on so I think I was a car first. And the guy freaked out. He had the gas. <laughs> and I vroom, he was bit away from us. And I was like, do I keep up? You know, and so I chased him for a little while. And I went above him and then I went in front of him and stopped. And he's, I mean, he spun the car around a little bit trying to stop. And he's just staring at us. And I was like, okay, enough, enough. We're going. And I left. And uh, when I hear you talking about things, I silently think about these incidents in my life. And I'm like waiting to hear that, ha you know, somebody describe that. So I don't talk about it too often. But that is one of the ones that I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is what I mean when I say. <laughs> I always learn something new because you know this is a lifetime of experiences for you. It's really impossible to cover in one book. It's really why I wanted to do 
this interview today because there's so much to learn about all of this. So we've covered a lot. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the close calls you've had. Or like, you know, have you ever missed a light gate or have you ever, you know, dropped, you know, when the gravitational field lines become too wonky? <laughs> I mean, could you describe some of the more weird close calls you may have had? Or just a couple examples? I was, uh, we were up and it was daylight in the field guideline and it was at the 37th parallel. And uh, it just went left like by several hundred feet suddenly and I had nothing under me. And my instinct is to jump, up, to power up, do a power up. And you'll see the whole craft will light up instantly and I go from battery straight to nuclear at that point. I'm, I want my... I want my ability to use my own gravitational ability to get out of there and dropped about 6,000 feet. I was way up there and I just dropped and I felt it. I physically felt it. I was like, oh, crap. You know, but I, we got it going and I could hear Talat in the background going, good, 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 good catch, good catch, because it got him by surprise too. This one just shifted all the way to the left. That scared the holy bejesus out of me, okay? And I realized, oh my God, we can crash. You know, this is not a joke. If we had hit with no field, the whole craft would have busted up. It would have been bad and people would have been hurt under me. That, that scared the hell out of me. It left a mark in my brain. Don't do that. I became uh, ultra aware after that. I mean, my, my brain was constantly uh, after that. And it served me well, trust me. Another thing that happened to me is going through a light gate. I ended up going somewhere I wasn't supposed to. I didn't know. I don't know how I messed that up. I was young. And I ended up somewhere I wasn't supposed to be, and it was a big shock to me. And I got on the other side of that gate and stabilized on it. And to one, it was dead silent. We just sat there for a few minutes, and he said, well, are we going to go or not? <laughs> I was like, okay. And I had to recapture myself because I thought, how did I make that mistake? I got debriefed on that one. Uh, they literally sat me down and said, what were you doing? What were you thinking? They wanted to know every second of what I was thinking to get me to the wrong place. And I got worked on a little bit with that. You know, don't do that again. That could be bad. So, yeah, that was a big one for me. I, I felt like a me for a while, you know, I was berating myself everywhere, I, like it scared me. Um, let's see, what's another dumb, stupid thing I've done? Uh, come in, get ready to juice up, in other words, light up, power up. You have to bring the batteries up, they drop down somewhat. That's why you see a, a bottom part of the craft that's sort of like lowered. That's the battery packs coming down in the big craft. And, uh, Man, just powered up and that causes a problem with your field. Okay, if you got something sticking out on the craft, it can mess with the field somewhat and that causes a wonkiness getting out of the atmosphere. And that was a weird day for me, too. It's just these are just stupid things that happen to you until you learn not to forget to do them. All right, have you ever like knocked out the electronics of someone's house accidentally or something like that? <laughs> Yeah, happens. You're coming in. You're not oriented properly. The craft has a definite. Uh, the EMP that the craft produces is uh, a field of it. It's in a polarity on the craft, it's either north or south or east or west, whichever way we're turning, directing, or using the field lines. And if you're facing something directly, facing something, the EMP is in front of you. In whatever direction you're going and um, when you're incoming or you're coming down you turn away from it you turn around from it i don't need to see what's in front of me to guide this craft and uh, a couple times when i was younger i impeded in the entire neighborhood uh, that was <laughs> fun <laughs> or a car on the highway and they're just suddenly going oh my god you know and you worry about them crashing because when the car goes dead and the wheels are moving it goes dead and the wheels are moving and they can't you know if you don't have power steering that's great because you can yeah, but if you have power steering, they're kind of screwed. Uh, so yeah, I have to be very careful with that. And yes, I accidentally knocked power out. Yep. Has anyone like tried to photograph you when they weren't allowed and like that? We, closer I am to you, the less 
likely you're going to get a picture. Um, we hold out at about 3,000. If we're 3,000 feet away from you, you have a really good chance of getting us on film. Anything closer in than 3,000 feet, you're not going to because your camera, your digital camera, even the film itself can't handle that radiation and it'll knock it out. Uh, it'll stop it dead. Mm -hmm. We know what you're doing. We know you've got a camera in your hand and we know you're pointing at us. And if we don't want you to see us, we turn them to face you so that you can't film us. We allow the MP to just knock it out and then back off again. Yeah, this is all really interesting to me because, you know, when you first start talking about piloting the craft, um, I had heard this before and it was really even more confirmation for me, certainly, when Canadian researcher Grant Cameron put out his book Sky Pilots, which, you know, basically presents, I think it's more than a dozen cases of people who describe the same sort of experience. So would you say this is something that they commonly teach other people how to do? Uh, there's more than uh, 10 of us. I guarantee you there's lots of us. Um, they want us to catch up with them. They want, if you have abilities and they single you out for them, you have a very high chance of being offered this opportunity. And there are plenty of people on this planet who have taken that opportunity. I'm not the only one. Um, Do they not have their own pilots? I mean, why would they need to teach us? Or is it, is this situation is unique. And one of the situations that we're facing here is that we're at the end of a cycle and they're going to need a lot of craft to pick up a lot of people at the same time. And it's better for us. A human opens the door. It's the call get on now. Prepped everybody for this. They've been sending mental messages to everybody on this planet that they're coming. The day will happen will come down and remove humanity from the planet because it's, it will not be safe here anymore. And it's coming to that soon, rapidly. And it's better for you not to see Gray sitting there going, hey, how you doing? <laughs> be better if you see me going, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Time to go. And from me beforehand, too. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm talking. Is I want you to understand that this is, we're all being trained to help in our excursion, our and are saving ourselves. That's an important fact that everybody needs to like connect to. They're just gonna come here and do everything for us, not and not by a long shot, no they're not. They want us to use our abilities. They want us to listen to what they have to say. They want us to mentally prepare what's before us and pay attention to the truth because this situation is coming and it's real. And so this is serious of, stuff then, yeah. So this is ultimately the purpose of why they Agreed to teach you is because you know there is a purpose behind all this. It's not just fun and games. Absolutely, you know it's not why me and nobody else. It's um, I'm one of a lot of people here that have this ability and are working it. All right, so I want to begin to wrap this up because we've been talking almost an hour now, and I want to give you the opportunity to sort of you know give what the ET's message is to all of us and how important. I think it's you know basically having to do with the development of our psychic abilities to help o overcome what we're facing. But yeah, I mean, however you want to wrap this up, I want to give you that opportunity because this is a big part of your experiences is flying craft, you know, sc scooping up people to examine and heal them and guide them and counsel them and so forth. But uh, yeah, I mean, what is the ET's message to, because I believe you wanted to sort of close with that. Humanity has a huge opportunity not before it. Yes, things are going to be difficult. Yes, they're going to be explosive in front of us and cataclysmic in front of us. But we're, we're awesome people like them. We have their children. And we have a lot of ability. We know it innately. We know it. We're good. Um, but you have to choose for yourself if you're going to go with this. And it's important to think about it critically. Do this and decide for yourself, everybody, each one of you, to either, no, I'm just going to stay as I am, copacetic, whatever happens. Or you can embrace the chance to make this leap with them, to make this journey with them, learn with them. And you have to do a little bit of work yourself beforehand. And it's not hard to do. You just have to decide to do it. 
And the first decision in that, and the very first decision you must do, learn to separate yourself from what's going on in this world. Because right now, it is a jumble of misinformation, of outright lying, a fantasy that is not true, not real. Happy, joyful, and knowing that you have an opportunity before you to do great things for yourself and yourself of whatever woes this world has put upon you, because you're going to go on a journey if you so choose. And that's the message. It's time. Make up your mind which way you want to go. Really think it through. Take a day. Sit down and let the universe talk to you. Let ET talk to you. Listen to what they're saying. Help. Yeah, well, that's really encouraging, actually. This is a message I've heard uh, that other contactees certainly have told me this sort of thing about the sky filling with craft, um, warnings of, you know, hard times ahead, and all this stuff that you're saying is certainly familiar to me, but it's really wonderful to hear it in such detail and such positive terms. And it's just it's just really cool and really remarkable that we have these people out there <laughs> who are working so hard to help us through this transition. And I think it's important that people know, and like you say, try to sift through all the lies, uh, the disinformation, the false narratives our governments are putting forth, and look to the truth, look to science, look to your own experience. And this is something that's available to anyone, right? I mean, anyone can reach out to these guys. Very cool. Yeah. Any, anything else you want to add? Just happy, joyful. These, these days in front of you to uh, work on yourselves and your families and uh, gain consciousness, regain the ability to reach and tap your own consciousness and then your others as well. It's a beautiful thing to do and it's fun. <laughs> Very cool. Fun. I can't tell you how much fun this was for me. All of it. <laughs> I can only imagine. I mean, wow, it's fun driving a car. So to say my other car is a UFO, that's a bumper sticker I've seen, is and have it be true <laughs> is beyond <Okay>. it. <laughs> it's just really amazing. So yeah, thanks, Dolly. That was awesome. And uh -huh. I definitely learned some stuff and it was certainly really interesting. And we did cover part of this in the book, Symmetry, A True UFO Adventure. So if you all want to read more about Dolly's experiences, definitely check out that book. But yeah, Dolly, huge thanks to you. I uh, really appreciate you coming on to the show. Very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> all right. That's the show for tonight, guys. Thanks very much for watching. I truly appreciate it. And as I always like to say, Keep searching for answers, keep looking for the truth, and most importantly, keep having fun. Right, Dolly? Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> All right, bye, guys.